Scott Freddy, Team Super Speeders. Scott Rob Peretti. My name's Rob Ferretti. Uh, I was born in Hackensack, New Jersey. That's northeast New Jersey, just outside of New York City. It's a suburb of New York City and not the Jersey that you think of when you think of Snooky. I got into cars when I was eight, roughly 18. I was working at a golf course in Bergen County, New Jersey, Rivervale Country Club. And uh, a guy pulled up in a, I'll never forget it, it was a Millennium Metallico Diablo VT Roadster. And you don't have to be into cars to see one of those roll up and be like, whoa, I'm into cars now. Working at that time, like I dreamed comfortable. I was like, wow, I'd love to be able to make $100,000 one day and that would be a great income to make every year and I'll be living so comfortably. And when I saw that car, my whole, my whole goal set changed and I was like, I need something like that in my life. I went to a private high school in Bergen County, New Jersey, Saddle River Day School. Um, I went from there to Gettysburg College on an extracurricular activity scholarship, so that means they paid me to play golf. Uh, I went to Ramapo College in New Jersey from there. I decided that college wasn't really worth that $35,000 a year. That, I mean, when somebody's paying for it, great, but uh, when it's out of your pocket, it wasn't worth nearly that much. I got within, I want to say, a semester of graduating. Uh, because I, I started by taking all the classes that I found valuable and all the, uh, the I don't even remember what they call them, the, the ones that you have to take these core BS classes, uh, women's studies and, and phys ed. I said, I don't need to take this. I'm not gonna spend money to take this. I don't need a degree because a degree doesn't get you a job. Brains get you a job or skill sets get you a job. A degree gets you maybe an interview, but I've seen a lot of dumb people go through college and get that same degree. College wasn't the strainer that I thought it was, so. The first car that I got that I would consider like my first like attempt at a cool car was a 99 Camaro. It was a V6 automatic and there was a lot of thought that went into that. And that was like, all right, the Corvette, Cooler car, clearly a cooler car, but it does zero to 60 in like 4.2 seconds. The Camaro does zero to 60 in 4.8 seconds. That's less than half a second. Who's gonna be paying attention to that? Like this thing is just as fast as that thing practically. So I went with the Camaro because it was cheaper, it was a better value. I would race every Honda and everything that you ever came across. And then one day I pulled up uh, next to a BMW M3 and I went to go race him. And no joke, the E36 M3 blew my doors off like I was standing still. I, it couldn't have been stock, I hope it wasn't stock, but I was like, holy crap, I don't know what just happened, I need a faster car. I went up, uh, I placed an order on a Corvette, which the Mustang I was planning on getting it and modifying it and doing some Celine bits and everything like that. With the Corvette, I'm like, you know what, I'll just get a Corvette, which will probably be the same amount of money that I'll put into the modified Mustang, and I'll just leave it stock. And I went up, ordered the Corvette. The Corvette came in three weeks later.
Filming cars wasn't, like I didn't really do it with the intention of turning it into something. Uh, filming cars was just like, I, this is before YouTube, believe it or not, there was a time. Um, and back in the early 2000s, uh, you'd go onto a forum, any chat room, and, and somebody would post a link to a video, you'd click on it, vroom, a car flies by. Just like standard clips, you're not even talking like edits. Oh, that was a cool clip of that car flying by. And I remember seeing those and I'm like, all right, like this, everybody's talking about this clip like it's a big deal. I mean, my buddies, like, we, like there was a guy around the corner at a Viper. We do this stuff like on the weekend and like, that's nothing. So I went to Best Buy, bought a $300 like Tie 8 video camera. I knew people that like worked IT for companies, they would just stick it on their company server for me. And then like, it's, it was always the same thing started playing out. Holy crap, dude. Like I've got like a $4,000 traffic spike on the site. Like I'll bury it into like the company, but I'm like, oh, well, that, that's pretty interesting. I'm like I can't afford to host my own videos. Cause I mean, you're talking thousands of dollars a month and it wasn't making anything at the time. But I was like, well, that's interesting. If, if these videos can they have enough demand that it can cost money to share it with people, I could probably make some money by packaging it. And that's when I went back to Ramapo for uh, one class on editing. And I took one basic like video editing class and, and started making DVDs from there. I, I made my first DVD called Life After the Quarter Mile, which I don't even sell it anymore. I've got like a couple copies, but like, I'm, it's like, it's like the artist on his first painting. It's like, oh yeah, that's pretty terrible. And some people find it desirable, but I was like, it's fun, it's real, it's raw. I, I went to the New York Auto Show, set up a booth and sold it. And I made like $25,000 in a week. And I was like, Great, I found out what I'm gonna be doing. I can, I can go work one, like literally, like I'll go work one week and I make what I make the rest of the year like carrying golf bags. I'm like, this is great. After life after the quarter mile, and I made money off of that, naturally came life after the quarter mile volume two and i called that one lap in new york city um that video got picked up by inside edition and some other news outlets because it was so oh, you gotta see this from there inside edition is the one that they came up with they call them super speeders and we're like oh we like that so i rebranded the uh the second dvd which i made the B first dvd of the super speeder series i called it super speeders one lap in new york city Thank, thank Deborah Norville. Really, we were racing up the highway. We were going fast. We were doing like stupid stuff. We were toying around with cars. And that's something that, that if you're in the, the space, you know it exists. But most other people are like, whoa, I, I can't imagine this. Like, this is unbelievable. You have to look at this. Come, come here, Martha. Like now you get it on YouTube everywhere. You're like, now you're not surprised by anything. But back then it was like the original shock factor of like, I can't believe this actually takes place. I drove that road yesterday. Look, look at what they're doing. A lot of the people I met were from chat rooms. Uh, Corvette Forum was a popular one, then Ferrari Chat was another one that I was on. Um, and you're just talking, everybody gets together, you go have drinks and like, it's not hard to, if you have a car, it's not just like I'm a guy with a, whatever, a, a Civic and I show up to these events and they're still welcome. Um, but you show up to these events and it's one of those things like as long as you go out there and you're not a dick and you're personable and you like to talk cars, there's a lot of commonality there. And there's guys that have Ferraris started out as guys with Civics. I mean, at the end of the day, nobody was born and like, I guess my first Ferrari when I was 16 and like it, there, there are very few people that are like that more and more that you see on Instagram nowadays but a lot of people have to earn it and a lot of people were there and they, they relate and you're like, look, I was in the same seat you were. The rental car business started uh, as an idea from Noah. Noah had a company called, I think it was True Exchange or something, uh, straight out of college. He went to MIT. Him and his buddies came up with some trading software sold for couple hundred thousand dollars um, but at his age he's like cool like I've got a couple hundred thousand bucks in my pocket let me go do something 
and he wanted to go rent, he's not gonna go out and buy a car because he didn't have enough, but he wanted to go rent a car. And he looked up and there was nowhere to really rent an exotic car in New York. I looked into it and said like, oh cool. Like, if I do a reverse Google search, I could see that 75 people a day look for Ferrari rental in New York. So if I get a Ferrari, I only have to convince one of those people every day to rent it and then I can get a free Ferrari. That's essentially where the idea came from. Uh, I met him at a Ferrari show in New Jersey. He was sort of like me, it's just like nice guy. Uh, and he went on Ferrari chat and we sort of ended up at the same car show at some guy's house in central Jersey. We both young guys, we hey, what's up going on? We, I'm personable, I, I introduced myself or he introduced himself to me. And he said he was looking to start the company. And I was like, well, that's a great idea, I think. Uh, I think it's fairly dangerous. I don't think anyone, you're gonna rent your car, the first guy's gonna crash it and you're never gonna see it again. Um, but he's like, no, no, I've, I've sort of, I tried to think this through. And I said, well, you know what, call me when it works. Like, call me when you start the company. And sure enough, uh, he started the company. He didn't have any rentals lined up or anything like that. He just had a Ferrari in his garage. And he's like, I got a Ferrari. And uh, I had some free time because I was making DVDs, which was like a three month a year process. And uh, it sort of worked out. He needed help. He didn't really know what he was doing. He didn't know cars too well. And he focused on websites and getting customers in. I focused on handling the deliveries and getting cars to people. And it grew from there. I met Matt Farah. He uh, came and applied for a job at Gotham Dream Cars. And uh, I interviewed him and he came and he was convincing in his interview, so I hired him. And Matt worked for us for, I wanna say a year and a half. Um, and then he went from working from us to going over to a place called New York Motor Club and trying to make videos and doing stuff with them. And then started doing the Garage 419 and then into the smoking tire. So he started moving into the content creation as well um, in about 07 uh, when he left Gotham Dream Cars. But that's where I met him and we maintained a friendship since then. Oh, the car's not doing anything right now. I'm gonna pass the jet on the shoulder. Here we go, in a parking lot because carts could hit it like this. <laughs> Let's just go over the tickets we've gotten this week because it's the last day and hopefully we won't get another one on the way to Vegas, but I started my YouTube channel, I think in October of 2006, and it was when I was on my third DVD. So that's what I used as sort of a promotional tool, and I, I, there was probably 10 uploads in the first like three years. I mean, we're not talking like a high volume channel here. The first to get a ticket chat, it's usually the bigger videos that people, I mean, everybody knows me for something else. There are people that know me for the uh, Ford GT running from cops, which they still think I'm driving for some reason, even though I'm the guy holding the camera, or essentially like the guy in the passenger seat shouting the directions. Um, there's people that know me from the $500 car challenges, the best cop moments. They know me for like, it really depends on what video was like somebody's favorite that they're like, that's the guy from, there's no simple answer is like, I'm not known for the color of my clothing. Okay. Like that dude in blue. I'm just kidding. <laughs> YouTube sort of opened a couple of avenues as far as just being more well-known in the auto industry. So I get a lot of inquiries, uh, people looking for me to promote their product, inviting me to events, asking me to cover stuff. Um, people like uh, meeting Rob Dom when I went to go buy. It's just the whole set social networking thing where I'm out there, uh, other people like Rob Dom are out there. I said I was going to Chicago to get a, uh, an NSX and he's like, hey, do you wanna meet up? on the way back. I live just off of the highway that you're gonna be taking on the way back. I'm like, yeah, I've got nothing else going on. I'll happily meet a random dude at the truck stop somewhere off of, uh, off of I-80. And sure enough, we did. I'm not gonna say what side of the glory hole he was on, but uh, it was nice to, to meet another car enthusiast. Uh, he brought his Diablo over, I brought my NSX. It was, it, was a, it was a cool thing to do. And it's just stuff like that. We would have never met. I would have driven past. He would, he would be non-existent to me. I would be non-existent to him. It's the fact that this platform broadcasts us out there as people and personalities and people that you feel you know that enables people to get together. And then Rob introduced me to David with Adventure Drives. He's like, hey, you, you should invite this guy on. He would be great. And that's how I met David. And that's the click just keeps, keeps on growing. I remember a couple specific instances where 
a professor would tell me, oh yeah, it's, uh, and I was snow plowing at the time in the winter, and they're like, oh, we were talking about the difference between calcium chloride and halite, which are two both uh, ways to melt snow. And well, this is why this is more widely used. I'm like, no, this one costs 10 times as much. Calcium chloride is like, that's expensive. It's $40 a bag, halite's $4 a bag. And he's like, no, 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 and I'm like, and, he's, and I'm like, well, you're wrong. And I was going back and forth with the teacher and they're like, well, you're getting tested on what I say, so that's what you should learn. And I got that two or three times in college. And I was like, you know what? You're gonna teach people the wrong thing. Then why, like, what are we here for? If we're, if we're here memorizing things to get a grade on the test versus learning, why am I wasting my time? College is not, it's, it's for people to memorize stuff and quickly forget. People aren't going to learn. People aren't going to figure out a skill. Uh, the point that I would say that people should either stay in college or not is figure out what you want to do. If you can't figure out what you want to do four years after graduating high school, as soon as you figure out what you want to do and what you're good at, and, and what you want to do may be different than what you're good at, figure out what you're good at and then figure out how to make money doing that. The definition of being good at what you do is you make it look easy. And I work more than pretty much anyone I know. I work till like one, two in the morning every night. Um, I can't keep up with a lot of stuff. I've, I've always fall behind on emails. I fall behind on tasks. As many people as I get to try to help me, it always seems to grow and grow and mount how much stuff I can do or I want to do that I can't, I, I'm only one person. So I get up and enjoy every day. And, and like, I, I just, I'm always grinding. I'm always doing stuff that has to be done. Um, and it's the never ending task list that, that keeps me going. It's the constant growth that keeps me going. Now, you know, when, when I introduce myself, I'm just, Rob Ferretti uh, and like I don't like to get like a lot of people get into what they do or what they have as hey you may know me from the guy who's got that Lamborghini Aventador no it's a lot of people do that as sort of a power play I'm just Rob Ferretti they take it as it is I don't really introduce myself if they ask what I do uh, I have a career working with cars and, and I usually tell them I have a car rental company and I make internet videos it just it's I, I never want to sort of overrun the conversation and, and take away from what somebody else does. I like to be on even footing with people.